Tonight, Texas is the first state to criminalize the manipulated videos known as deep fakes. We'll talk about the possible constitutional questions the new law raises. A new report shows that members of the LGBTQ community are less likely to report abuse by a domestic partner. And we experienced some relief from the heat today, so how long will it last? Thanks for joining us for KSAT News at 9 from right here in the KSAT 12 newsroom. I'm Myra Arthur. We begin tonight with something freaky, frankly, technology that can be used to make it appear as if someone said or did something that they really did it. They're called deep fake videos and concern about them is certainly growing. Take a look at this one. You might have actually seen it before. This is video of former President Barack Obama addressing the nation, but it was manipulated to match up with the words of a comedian, Jordan Peele. A Texas lawmaker is leading the fight in trying to crack down on these deep fake videos. He is actually behind a law addressing this very issue. Our Tiffany Huertas talks to him about this law and also a law professor who weighs in on whether this could be entering into territory protected by the First Amendment. Texas Senator Brian Hughes says deep fakes could pose a threat to elections. Deep fake videos are so real looking and so deceptive that it was obvious to us that they could be used for real, real damage uh, in the election area. Hughes is behind Senate Bill 751, which went into effect in September. The bill says if you create a deepfake video and publish or distribute within 30 days of an election, you are committing a criminal offense. If you send it out and it's not real close to the election, well, then there's time for folks to do some research, for folks to figure out that this is false. But if we're within 30 days of an election, people are about to be voting on who they're going to choose for an office, whether it's mayor, or president or county commissioner, uh, if we're within 30 days of an election, uh, you could mislead a lot of people. We asked the senator if this bill is violating the First Amendment. If there is time through discussion and debate and research to correct the situation and the harm is not so great, then we don't limit the speech. We only limit free speech in a case like this where the harm is so great and there's no other way to address it. We also asked a St. Mary's University law professor about how the First Amendment impacts deep fakes. It can act as a break on legislation and does because uh, governments, federal, state, and local, are not allowed to enact laws which infringe on First Amendment rights. So in the hypothetical I mentioned where the individual as a joke, as a parody, as satire is portraying uh, an incorrect image of an individual, uh, that may be protected by the First Amendment because there was no specific intent to injure or harm that individual or uh, to undermine the election. Summers says although it could be hard to prove the intention of a video or post, deep fakes can be damaging. It can be extraordinarily damaging and because of social media platforms it can be disseminated rapidly, globally, certainly nationally. And those images, once planted in the minds of those who are reading social media, or participating in social media is very difficult to erase. According to CNN, the Pentagon, through the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, is working with several research institutions to get ahead of deep fakes. Myra? All right, thanks, Tiffany. Domestic violence victims often find the problem so very difficult to report. That is especially true within the LGBTQ community. A recent study found that this problem is prevalent within that community and very rarely reported. It's part of our Loving and Fear series that we are addressing this very issue. Take a look at this survey here. In 2012, the National Intimate Partner and Sexual Violence Survey found that 44% of lesbian women and 61% of bisexual women reported experiencing physical violence, stalking, or rape by intimate partners. 26% of gay men, 37% of bisexual men reported the same. Then a 2012 report by the National Coalition of Anti-Violence Programs found that fewer than 5% of LGBTQ survivors sought protective orders. A survivor named Stacy Sumlinson took her took took her a year rather to get out of an abusive relationship with her ex-girlfriend. She talked to her Courtney Friedman about that. She says past experiences of discrimination can sometimes make it seem like LGBTQ people are accustomed to abuse even in relationships. 
I just think uh, you know everybody should be equal and have the equal opportunities that everybody else does because you know God's created all of us and that's the main thing. We all bleed the same colors. Tumblances says that she is proud the San Antonio City Council put extra money toward combating domestic violence and aiding LGBTQ victims in its 2019 budget. If you or a loved one or anyone you know is in an abusive relationship, there is help out there. We have a list of resources right now on our website at ksat.com. You can find those by going to ksat.com slash domestic violence. A key witness is killed after the murder trial of a former Dallas police officer convicted of killing her neighbor. A group of students in North Carolina is now under investigation for a racist group chat and a grandfather here in San Antonio under arrest after a gun he bought was allegedly used to kill a teenager. This is tonight's nine at nine. A local man facing capital murder charges is accused of stealing a car and running down pedestrians in February of 2015. In the end, two were dead and four seriously injured. And now the trial for that driver begins. Jury selection began today in the trial of Manuel Garcia. Though this is a capital murder case, the state's not asking for the death penalty. A conviction would mean life in prison without the possibility of parole. A man who was a key witness in the murder trial of a Dallas police officer was gunned down over the weekend. Joshua Brown used to live next to Botham John. Brown testified that he heard John and Amber Geiger interacting the night that John was killed. He said he never heard the officer give him any instructions contradicting her testimony. Authorities have not linked Brown's murder with his testimony, but his lawyer believes he was shot by someone who had an ax to grind. MacArthur High School's head football coach arrested in North Central Texas. Ben Cook is accused of assaulting someone to the point of impeding their breath. He was arrested yesterday in Brown County and has been released on a $10,000 bond. Northeast ISD has placed Cook on administrative leave for now. School administrators in North Carolina investigating a group of students who created a racist chat group online. The group chat was reported by a 14 year old black girl who posed with a white face avatar after she heard rumors about what was going on. When she was allowed access to the group, she found offensive messages targeting the black community. It made me feel very offended and to find out who the person was that made the group chat, I was really shocked. Here at home, a teenager and his grandfather arrested in charge in the death of a 13 year old boy. We first broke the story last month when the shooting happened on the far north side of the county. The Bear County Sheriff's Office says the 14 year old initially called 911 saying the victim accidentally shot himself in the head. But investigators now believe the boy accidentally fired the gun his grandfather left unsecured. The teen is charged with manslaughter. His grandfather is charged for making a firearm accessible to a child. Thousands of taxi drivers in Mexico City demonstrated against what they consider to be unfair competition by apps like Uber. The protest led to traffic backups in that busy city. Delta Airlines, the Orlando Airport and TSA investigators are now trying to figure out how a woman made it onto a plane without an ID or a boarding pass. Another passenger alerted flight attendants when she found the woman sitting in her seat. Who knows what I did? I just threw it out as soon as I got on the plane. Okay, well I'm showing you a picture I did. This is, a, this is just as good. She was eventually escorted off the plane. At this point, it's not clear if the woman will be charged. The FBI is joining the investigation. Meanwhile, Delta says it's conducting its own review of what happened. A dog trapped under debris was found alive weeks after Hurricane Dorian devastated the Bahamas. The dog was discovered by a drone using infrared heat seeking technology. Rescuers named the dog Miracle because they say he is lucky to be alive. In New York, a scary situation at a salon all caught on camera. A deer can be seen crashing through the front door, running into the break room and then circling around to run back out. The woman sitting on the couch was hurt but is expected to be okay. To read more about these nine stories, go to ksat.com slash news at nine. Adam Kasky joins us tonight, and today was the day that we were all waiting for. That's right. Some nice fall changes. <laughs>
Yeah, it brought us back to where we should be. South is Texas what it did. fall. Exactly. I should, uh, yeah, I should clarify. We, we had a continuation of summer through September and for the first week of October. Now we're back to where we should be. This is nice. Get ready for a lot of ups and downs, though, this week. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, it's a, you know, fairly typical fall pattern, finally, where we have, you know, things constantly changing. We'll take and, the downs, down temperature-wise. <laughs> yeah, right? and air masses are moving around. <laughs> All right, so outside, currently we're at 77. A clear sky, dew point of 58, so fairly low humidity, uh, much better than what we had last night at this time, and especially what we had last week at this hour when we were dealing with the heat and humidity still. Northeasterly breeze has slackened up a little bit. It pumped the brakes this evening, and it's going to generally stay between 5 and 10 miles per hour through the rest of the night. Now, dew points in the hill country down in the 40s, even 54 in Kerrville, but 46 Rock Springs, 45 Junction, and we're starting to see some dew points in the 60s closer to the coastline. Overall, comfortable along and especially west of I-35. Now, big temperature difference, and that's pretty common on a day where you have a frontal passage. So right now we're 68 Rock Springs, but 82 in Catula. So big difference north to south. And the front, it takes a while for that cooler air to really filter across all of South Texas. So we go up to the Panhandle, Lubbock 58 along with Amarillo, but then 83 in Laredo. Overall though, this cool front has kind of evened out temperatures across the plains, you know, north and south, up and down the plains. So here's our overall weather pattern. No big heat high really dominating our weather. Uh, but we will see a little bit of a warm up later this week during the middle part of the week. However, we're looking up in Canada at this little ripple in the upper level flow, little dip there, little disturbance associated with that temperatures in the 30s and 20s at this hour. And that cooler air is going to be making its way southward. And that's our next cold front that's going to be hitting us at some point Friday. So by Wednesday crosses the border. It's in Montana, Idaho and Oregon and then Thursday, it continues to push its way southward. And at some point, we think around midday Friday, boom, the leading edge of that cooler air mass should hit us. Now, keep in mind, it is going to modify as it moves southward. It's going to warm up a little bit. So we're not talking 20s and 30s around here, but it will actually give us more noticeable changes for the upcoming weekend. So here's the breakdown for you. Tuesday morning, 60 degrees comfortable, refreshing start to the day. 78 at noon, then 85 the high temperature and a lot of sunshine. So a big temperature jump from the morning to the afternoon, low humidity, but the humidity starts returning on Wednesday will be near 90 hot and humid 93 on our Thursday. But at some point Friday, that front hits maybe bringing with it a few showers and look what it does for the upcoming weekend. I mean, at that point, we're talking mornings in the low 50s and high Saturday and Sunday in the 70s. Now that's a front. Won't last long. Yeah, it won't. It won't exactly. So anyway, I like to highlight that for you too. <laughs> we don't mind it. Thanks, Adam. <laughs> we want to remind everybody that we are just about a month away from the special election coming up in November. And if you don't know what's going to be on the ballot for that special election, we've got you covered there. Right now on our website, you can go to ksat.com to find a sample ballot, including a Bear County ballot. Just go to ksat.com slash news at nine. Early voting begins on October 21st and then election day is on November 5th. Have you ever lost a button on a blouse and just left that clothing item hanging in your closet because you didn't feel like going to get it fixed? Or maybe you've never worn a pair of pants because they're a little too long and you don't know how to hem them. Most of us have been in a situation like this. It's why we spoke to a fashion merchandising expert from UIW to get some advice on what to do. RJ Marquez lays out the tips she gave us in tonight's adulting hack. Most of us have been in a situation where a button falls off of our clothes. So we asked Melinda Adams, professor of fashion merchandise at UIW, what's the easiest way to sew that button back on? Hopefully you have a needle and thread. You'll also need a toothpick. This will create a shank to keep the button away from the fabric while you sew, so your shirt will close properly. Will you place the button on top of the toothpick and the fabric underneath it? and you sew through the holes around and around until it's tight. Next, remove the toothpick and wrap the thread underneath the button a couple of times until it feels secure. And you fixed your button and saved yourself probably 20 bucks from having the dry cleaner do it. Another thing you've probably come across before and will come across again, pants that are too long. Here's a quick fix that doesn't involve a needle and thread. You can just take some double-sided tape, put it on the inside of your hem, hold it up, 
and just press it together and that will hold your pants. They also sell double-sated fabric tape that you can buy at the fabric store. The fabric tape should hold up even in the washer and last for years. And now that it's nearly sweater season. So sometimes with our sweaters, we get snags in them. And so it's really easy to fix that. All you have to do is find the loose thread, take a needle or sharp object and pull it through the back side of your sweater. That will save you from having that run or getting it snag further and creating a huge hole in your sweater. There are also iron-on patches you can buy to cover up holes. Here's a quick trick you may have not thought of to loosen up a stuck zipper. Depending on the fabric, you can put a little WD-40 on it or vegetable oil just right there to get your zipper to move up and down. Um, that works if it's a metal zipper. Adulting Hacks is just one of the series we feature exclusively here on the News at 9. Here's a look at some of the others. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for a new installment in our consumer series, Money It's Personal. You're watching KSAT News at 9. We'll be back in just one minute. Testimony is set to begin tomorrow in the case of Bradley Croft. He is the man accused of stealing from veterans through his dog training program. Now, last year, Croft was indicted on eight counts of wire fraud, four counts of aggravated identity theft, and two counts of money laundering. The indictment alleges Croft submitted false information for veterans' dog training services and collected more than a million dollars in payments from the GI Bill. If he's convicted, he could face more than 40 years in prison. Let's turn now to some of tonight's top stories. The president facing backlash from his own party after announcing plans to withdraw troops from Syria. He declared U.S. troops would step aside for an expected Turkish attack on the Kurds, who have been longstanding allies of the U.S. in the fight against ISIS. Republican Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell urged the president to reverse the decision. South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham also questioned that decision, saying he hopes the president reconsiders. President Trump says he understands criticism from fellow GOP leaders, but he disagrees. U.S.-Mexico border arrests continued to drop last month. The drop represents a steady decline in the arrests since the high early this spring when the Trump administration struggled to reduce crossings. The nearly 40,000 arrests in September represent the lowest monthly figure this year. By comparison, there were almost 133,000 arrests in May. Seven new measles cases were reported in the U.S. last week. That brings the number of cases for the year up to 1,250. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reports cases have been confirmed in 31 states. Most measles cases have occurred among people who have not been vaccinated. Now to the latest on the impeachment inquiry against President Donald Trump. House Democrats issued a new pair of subpoenas today, this time to the heads of the Defense Department and the Office of Management and Budget. The House chairs requested information regarding the Trump administration's decision to delay military aid to Ukraine. The request comes as a second whistleblower has now come forward. The unnamed member of the intelligence community claims to have firsthand information about the president's efforts to push Ukraine to investigate Joe Biden and his son, Hunter Biden. The president still insists he did nothing wrong. It was a perfect call. Uh, it's just a scam. This is a scam by the Democrats to try and win an election that they're not going to win in 2020. The president also said the impeachment inquiry is driving his poll numbers higher, but he did say it's making it harder to do his job.
We've been talking a lot about the impeachment inquiry lately, but what exactly is it and how does the impeachment process work? Steve Spreister with the basics of understanding impeachment. <laughs> Under the United States Constitution, the president can be removed from office before the end of his or her term for, quote, treason, bribery, or other crimes and misdemeanors, end quote. The House of Representatives has sole power of impeachment, while the Senate has sole power to try all impeachments. Impeachment begins in the House. The lower chamber debates and votes on whether to bring charges against the president, also known as Articles of Impeachment. The articles must each be passed by a simple majority of the House's 435 members. If this happens, a trial will be held in the Senate. House members act as prosecutors, senators act as jurors, and the Supreme Court's Chief Justice presides. Two-thirds of the United States' 100 senators have to find the president guilty for him or her to be removed from office. This has never happened in U.S. history. Only three past presidents have been subject to impeachment proceedings. Andrew Johnson and Bill Clinton were impeached by the House but not convicted by the Senate, and Richard Nixon resigned from office to avoid being impeached. In the event that a president is removed from office, the vice president would serve the remainder of his or her term. Let's go to our website now to find out what's trending this evening with Ivan Herrera. Myra, thank you for having me. All right, three great trending stories for you today. The first one, tis the season for delicious pumpkin. All Everything. Things pump all things pumpkin, But yes. this story isn't about eating pumpkin. It's actually about the record-setting heaviest pumpkin in the Topsfield Fair in New England. All right. So let me give you some insight into this. The winner of the all New England giant pumpkin way off came in at 2,294.5 pounds. So this thing is huge. This thing needed a forklift. Huge, huge, huge. So to give you a little bit more perspective, one of the lightest cars on the market weighs 2,018 pounds. Wow. It's crazy huge. I wonder if this is bigger than one of those smart cars. Yeah, you know, I think it is, it is. Little tiny roller skate yes. looking cars. And the winner snagged a prize of $8,519. That's pretty cool. I mean, wow. you got to win something. You go to KSI.com, there's a lot more there. Cool. All right, next up, Willie Nelson is on the road again. He's touring and he's gonna be stopping in San Antonio because you know he loves us. All right. All right, so he's gonna be at the Majestic Theater November 25th and 26th. So your tickets, if you wanna get them, Friday at 10 a.m. That's when they go on sale Ooh, okay and they range from about 50 to 100 dollars. so not too too bad okay. if you want to go see the country music legend. icon legend yes the star and if you head to kinset.com right now you can actually check out paul venema's interview with the country legend himself. i was just thinking paul's yes. gonna talk to him yes. i'm sure because yes. he and paul they're buds i love buds. i love watching him whenever we have that interview yeah. interviews with him i love watching his like Those stories so he's a really cool guy all right last up I told you that I was gonna surprise you, so okay. last up, some might find this flavor of ice cream a little strange, but it's a, all the rage in Ecuador. In Ecuador, yes. okay. So, and it's becoming quite popular. So I am, of course, talking about guinea pig flavored ice cream. Of course you are. <laughs> of course it's guinea pig flavored ice cream. Yes, what? those guinea pigs. Uh, guinea pigs are quite, actually a quite common dish in Latin American countries, such as Colombia, oh. Peru, and Bolivia. So oh, it's no. not a huge deal over there um, that's a big deal to me that does not seem that does that yeah. seems bad so they say that it's actually similar to a chicken flavor which like every animal that's not chicken they're like oh it tastes like chicken tastes like chicken exactly be fine. yes yeah. no. so that's what they describe it and if you want to see the process of how one ecuadorian vendor makes that ice cream you can head to case i don't com. want chicken flavored ice cream it's it's guinea pig that's that's <laughs> Either one of those options. They're bad, Andrew. They're per bad. Personally, I'll just stick to Rocky Road. That's just yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Thank Cookie you for dough. having me. Myra. Sounds real good. Right about now. That's it. That's all I got for you. <laughs> that Thank is you. where we end. Thanks, Ivan. We'll be right back. Today, I am going to one of my favorite places, the Witty Museum, to check out their new exhibit: mythic creatures, dragons, unicorns, and mermaids. Let's go.
This exhibit is going to cover the origins and the cultural diversity and the history behind a lot of the legends we're familiar with and several that we're not. And then of course tell some of the facts behind some of these and so some of them um, can be related back to just the misidentification of modern day animals like giant squids and rhinos and things like that as well as the fossils. Early explorers are discovering fossils of dinosaurs or mammoths and mastodons, not knowing what they are, it gave credence and evidence to some of these legends of dragons, giants, and cyclops. For more on the Mythic Creatures exhibit and more on the Witty Museum, you can go to ksat.com. For The Nine, I'm meteorologist Sarah Spivey. This is your daily tech and business briefing from Cheddar. Disney is testing Disney Plus in the Netherlands. The company is soft launching a streaming service to Dutch customers to iron out problems and kinks. Dutch users are reporting generally good experiences with few issues. The test indicates the importance of Disney Plus, which enters a crowded streaming market dominated by Netflix. And General Electric is going to freeze the pension plans of 20,000 U.S. salaried employees in an attempt to cut its massive debt load. The move will reduce its pension deficit to $8 billion. Uh, for years, GE has been under pressure to cut costs, divest non-performing assets, and restore growth. And retirees already collecting pension benefits won't see any change. And Ireland is set to decide on whether Facebook and Twitter violated EU data privacy rules. That is according to CNBC. A potential ruling will represent Ireland's first decision related to U.S. companies since privacy laws went into effect. If found guilty, companies can be fined up to 4% of global sales. For Facebook, that would mean more than $2 billion based on 2018 annual sales. And that's your Cheddar Business and Tech Update. I'm Kristen Schiller from the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. That's all our time here on the News at 9. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Myra Arthur. See you next time.